In war, people fight against each other, but in many situations there has been no war but only genocide. This history of American genocide is often ignored or sugarcoated by saying that Columbus simply discovered America. It's important the truth of American genocide is brought to light. This is about what really happened. Well, first of all, systematic, uh, deliberate and systematic extermination of a particular uh, hated target group. Generally, that's the way I'll say it. And in this case, in this country, the hated target groups were indigenous peoples, native peoples. There's five elements that will define a gen genocide, and only one of them involves killing. The other one is making it impossible for people to practice their way and uh, speak their language. You know, it's, it's the attempt to wipe out an entire race of people. started with, with mass murders and the disease and all that stuff. It continued when they realized that that wasn't totally working, that it continued into the boarding school era and taking away our cultural identity and our land and just taking away everything. When this continent was visited by Columbus and the others that came after him, the millions that came after him, most of them were not coming here because they wanted to learn about the native people and the native culture. They wanted to change it. And so the mythology grew that this was an empty land and it belonged to nobody and it never did and that it had no special significance to every, anybody. It was like uh, going to the moon. It was a brand new empty continent. That was the mythology that allowed so many people to come over here and believe that they had the right to claim whatever it is they wanted. Just six miles from here, you know, down at Fort Snelling uh, was a concentration camp where the Dakota people, largely women, children, and elders, were held prisoner after the 1862 war before they were shipped out. Another one is a uh, Pequot massacre of 1637, about 700 to 900 uh, Pequot people were fried in the fire. And, uh, and then, at, uh, of course, the uh, at what happened at Wounded Knee, you know, some 300 people slaughtered there, and uh, and then the Sand Creek Massacre in Colorado, where you know hundreds of uh, uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho were slaughtered there, and primarily again, women, children, and elders were slaughtered. In Minnesota, a um, sort of textbook example of genocide took place here, even though you won't read about it in Minnesota textbooks. The uh, War of 1862 between the Dakota Nation and the United States resulted in the death of about 500 European uh, soldiers and settlers, an untold number of Dakota people. Mankato, where they hung the 38 Dakota POWs after the after the war. Um, you know, again, you don't generally hang POWs at war. You punish them, you imprison them, uh, and you release them. I think the biggest negatives of the land being taken away is the loss of who we were. We're so connected to the land, to sacred sites, and our belief that everything is connected, everything is related. Um, obviously our you know connection to buffalo and hunting and all that. There's a psychological effect too, not having access to your land. I think we see this with a lot of native people. They get, they're disconnected from what is their true homelands. They don't have that, they've lost that relationship with the land. Very few people in the United States, you know, in the, say in the Ojibwe, or the Anishinaabe and Dakota communities here in Minnesota speak their language, particularly as their first language, and, um, and that's an impact of genocide.
they could speak their own language freely without being punished. They could uh, uh, roam where they chose. Groups like, and primarily the American Indian Movement, have been um, very active restoring many aspects of the culture to the people, as have elders, other groups, and active young people and activists. The state of Minnesota passed a legacy amendment for cultural, to dedicate money to support cultural, uh, cultural endeavors of different communities around the state. And, um, and uh, I know both Ojibwe and Dakota languages have gotten uh, a lot of money to help them pursue that. The 20th century for Natives has been about fighting back. Um, first, obviously, gaining you know citizenship and being able to vote, and then slowly, you know, taking our language back, our culture back, you know, fighting for basically our civil rights. Things that we can point to is the survival of Native people and the persistence of Native people, the way Native people have adapted in order to survive, and I think the, the resisting that Native people have done, the resisting of completely losing language and culture and life ways. We're still fighting to hold on to those things, and uh, it's important for people to know that this is an ongoing struggle. there gets to be a lot of tension between people who are successful outside the community and people successful within the community and if they both look at like well we both want the same thing you know that's how we can move move forward you know it, it should be uh, something that's that's just absolutely openly talked about and uh, openly talked about in regards to you know some of these issues that are that are that are huge problems in our community like drug abuse and alcoholism I mean there's an absolute link between historical trauma and those things. Historical trauma is pain. How do people deal with pain? They want to hide the pain. You know, they want to, they want to numb the pain in some way. And unfortunately, what they're choosing to do is not ever going to make the pain go away. The only thing that's going to make the pain go away is probably to deal with the pain on a, on a, on a level uh, that would involve some kind of counseling or some other kind of restorative kinds of things. So I think talking about it but also talking about it not in kind of the blaming kind of way where like your ancestors did it and it's like well no your government did it and so let's ask our government to do something right about it now right um and and i think that just pointing it out that way taking it off a person or their family because um, it really is a cultural and a social issue so the more that we talk about it the more that we acknowledge it the more that it's not something that's hidden back in the corner, the more that we can heal from it. I think one way we can start making a change is for Native families and Native students to start, to start saying, why aren't we learning about this in my class. Why is this never brought up? And I think to start changing our education systems is the place where we'll see the most, the greatest shifts. Um, you know, I talked a bit about how I'd like to see the whole state change, the citizens of Minnesota change. I think we're going to do that through education. I was taught that Columbus was a hero in discovering America. That is not the truth. If it wasn't for their persistence and longevity, there's a possibility that I or even you might not be here today. I'll end on a quote that says, only the strong survive. Our people are still here and will continue to fight the constant injustices that began with genocide. This is something that was never taught to me in school and something that I feel should not be ignored any longer. <laughs>